yeah, I, I really enjoyed that time. Okay, and so you, anyway, you went to university, qualified, well, I said you got your, your degrees, and you, you, tell us a little bit about your acting career. How was that for you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, when I was in school, there was an after-school drama club that I used to go along to, yep. and um, we did a few stage productions, and I really enjoyed that. I, I got uh, very, very heavily involved in that. And in my final year uh, in school, I decided that uh, the theatrical performances are not enough. We need to capture this for uh, posterity on, on videotape. And so I borrowed the video cameras from the computer teacher, from the art teacher, got whatever I could um, to, to do this. And we made a little film in, mm -hmm. in my final year. It was made without uh, mobile phones or without any of the sort of helpful oh, technology that we have yeah. today, which meant that uh, we had some situations where the actress was in one classroom and I was in the next classroom down the, the corridor and neither of us knew where the other person was and we had to call the whole shoot off and come back the following day after <laughs> having spoken on the landlines. So, yeah, it, it, was, uh, it was an experience. And then I carried on my uh, passion for acting and for uh, filmmaking and for drama when I was in, in Glasgow University as well. It was a theatre group there that I was heavily involved with. And um, the, the kind of people that I met there, they were just so full of life and so full of, of fun and, and had a real uh, joyful streak or a sort of mm -hmm. almost anarchic happiness in, in the world. That's how it came across to me, at least that I really, really took to them, and really enjoyed hanging out with these people. So uh, most, of my, most of the friends that I had from university were either from the Christian group or the drama group. And there were very few that were, in fact, I'm not sure there were any, that were in both groups uh, at the same time. They were, they were quite distinct groups, but uh, I was very glad to be able to uh, straddle both, both communities. Did you get yourself any, uh, say, major parts or even walk on part or anything that we might see you in? Uh, that you might see me in uh, today. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I, you'll take the higher role or something like that. You know what I mean? Uh, there was a production of the Thirty Nine Steps where my uh, my key role was to sell a newspaper to the main actor. So I, uh, I'm not sure was it BBC that produced it or some other group, but uh, I, I did do that. I was also acting as a zombie in another in a spin-off of uh, the Twenty Eight Days Later series. Okay. So. I had to sprint up Cumbernauld Airport at the, as fast as I could, dripping blood from my mouth. And uh, then later on that day, I was going down to London uh, for a holiday and discovered at the end of it that my room was three floors up and I had to haul my suitcase up. And my legs, after running all that time in the Cumbernauld Airport, could barely sustain my weight as I had to climb up the stairs to my room. So, wow. I'm, yeah, it wasn't my, uh, not my finest moment. It, it always struck me quite funny in movies. They see zombies always walk very slowly, mm. and people run, but they always caught everybody they were after. <laughs> <laughs> well, in this one, ironically, we ran at the, as fast as our legs could carry us and never caught anybody. So it was a, a different kind of filming. Now, the acting itself, did that sustain your lifestyle, or did you have to work on something else? Like, did you work, in, you know? Not at all. No, it was, uh, I think for a lot of people who are starting out as actors, it's not a, um, sustainable uh, career and mm -hmm. uh, it was certainly that way for myself. I think if, if in any way it had been uh, economically viable to remain as an actor, I probably would have done, but uh, it was quite clear to me very early on that it was just not at all uh, um, a long-term possibility. Mm -hmm. And so it ended up just being a hobby while I looked around for other, other options and ended up uh, moving instead into being a, a film director Okay. Uh, which, as well, is only partly up to an extent, uh, uh, what would you say, economically sustaining. So, mm -hmm. But working in the film industry, there are a lot more options. And so in my current work, I do sort of half in, as a producer-director and then half working on other people's shows, which is the one that brings in the money. So I have my creative outlet and my economic necessities. So what do you do? Do you do some editing or uh, directing or...? Uh, quite often I work in the production office or sometimes mm -hmm. I do assistant directing work, which is more of an organizational um, role. So mm -hmm. the director will have his vision for the, for the film and the assistant director will try to make sure that everybody's standing in the right place when the cameras roll. So, so what's it like being a director, a film director? 
Is it, is it like, you, like you see on the telly, you know? Is it... It's a lot of fun uh, as a film director, I, I would say, but uh, it's also a lot of pressure as well. You mm -hmm. really need to know what it is you're trying to do and then um, stick to that vision all the way through the film. Because when you're filming, there's so many uh, things that distract you or can pull you away in different, different directions. Um, whether it's positive or negative. So, you know, at one point I remember a meeting where we were discussing one way of how to how to film a scene and someone came in and said, I think my friend has got a, a helicopter that we could use. And me in my foolish days was like, wow, helicopter, let's do it, let's get it. And then, of course, we never got the scene because we spent ages trying to work out whether we can get this helicopter and it never transpired that we could, but we lost the chance to get the scene in a standard way. Mm -hmm. um, but then also on the, on the bad side as well, um, when we were filming our latest uh, film, Morning Star, and we were down in a studio in Manchester, and we we were filming a really intense moment where uh, our hero is in a prison cell and he can't do anything else except pray, and he ha has a little cross in front of him and he kneels down, and just at that moment that his knees were touching the floor, there came this almighty noise that everyone jumped out of their skin, wondered what in the world had happened. Is the roof collapsing or something? And we realized that it's the pub next door setting up for their uh, dubstep concert that's going to take place over the next 12 hours. Uh, what we look outside and see that all the cars in the car park, they're shaking backwards and forwards with their alarms going off because of the noise of, this, um, of these loudspeakers. So very fortunately, we've been able to get most of the conversation before that point, but... Uh, we spent the next 12 hours in one of the most oppressive film uh, environments that I've been in. Wow. Life Stories. Life Stories Worldwide is broadcast live every Monday night at 8 p.m. UK time. We are live on Facebook, Zoom and YouTube. So why not join us every Monday night at 8 p.m. So uh, you, you, you said you became a film director. Did that happen accidentally for you or is it something you planned or you moved into it, but, you know, bit by bit? Um, I think it was something that I've been following this path since I was about maybe 22, 23, something like that. But uh, as I said before that, I wanted to be an actor. Um, and before that, I wanted to be a wizard. So, you know, it's not exactly the something I've been wanting to do all my life. In fact, when I was a very small child, I wanted to be a baker because then I'd have a, the opportunity to eat all the donuts afterwards. <laughs> now, as a film director and a Christian, of course, are there lines you won't cross or things you won't do? Or are I mean, you open to anything? I think everybody's got uh, got lines that they won't cross. Uh, it's just a case of what these are. Mm -hmm. um, yes, for myself, there would be things that I wouldn't want to have in my films. Um, mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't want any actors or actresses to feel that they were being exploited in any of the mm -hmm. things that I was asking them to do. And I think that with the Me Too movement that's been coming out recently, there's a lot of new light has been shown on what actresses were expected to do to get their roles and to get their parts. And the way that um, when an actor or actress is in front of camera, they can sometimes be objectified by the people who are behind the camera and treated as though they're essentially just a, a, a organic prop. So I would always want to make sure that everybody was treated with absolute respect because I believe mm -hmm. in, um, that human beings are made in the image of God. And so it's very important to make sure that everyone retains their dignity throughout the, throughout the whole process. Um, Most of us know from reading and historically, of course, from Hollywood, that uh, the film industry in itself doesn't seem to have a very high moral standard. How, for you as a Christian, do you keep your moral standard in such an industry? I think the film industry is changing a lot. Um, 
for me, the biggest challenge has typically been working on Sundays because as a Christian, I say, no, I'm not going to work on Sundays. I'm going to keep that day uh, for God, mm -hmm. which is a minority viewpoint, uh, I would say, even among Christians and certainly amongst Christians who work in the film industry. So I, I fully respect other Christians that don't hold that viewpoint. But for me, that's just been part of my um, part of my belief structure all the way through mm -hmm. is that I want to keep this day Sunday uh, special. As a result, it means that I sometimes miss out on work, perfectly understandably at times, because they might be requiring people who are available on Sundays, and that's you know what, when they're going to shoot. Um, other times, I would say it's it's less understandable. I had one time, uh, specifically one time, I remember I applied for a job and said in my covering letter, uh, "I'm not going to be available on Sundays. I hope that's not an issue." And I got the, the email back saying, well, actually, we're not shooting on Sundays, but because you mentioned it and because you brought up that you're a Christian, I realize I don't want to work with you. So thank you and bye. Uh, you know, the, that was quite early on in my uh, career. I think I'd have a different response now, but at the time I was just like, thank you very much, goodbye. But uh, now I think I'd be uh, more a case of, do you realize that this is religious discrimination? It's actually illegal what you're doing. Not so much for me, but so that he doesn't do it again to someone else or mm -hmm. you know, that I can change his mind about it a little bit. Um, I'm not sure whether he'd be so blatant about that now as he was back then, but uh, you do occasionally come across that sort of anti-Christian prejudice. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So when, when it comes to filmmaking, I mean, you, you started, you said you started, well, you started a company called Trinity, Trinity Digital, is that correct? Yes. Tell us so, a little bit how that came about. So um, Trinity Digital was set up when I made my first documentary, which was called Knox. Uh, Knox is about John Knox, the uh, mm -hmm. reformer of Scotland. So in the same way that you've got Martin Luther and John Calvin as the sort of the big names in the continent, John Knox is the Scottish equivalent. And when I was growing up, we had a picture, a portrait of John Knox above our dining room table. He was always glowering down at us with his enormous great big eyebrows and his big beard as we were innocently trying to eat our toast or whatever it is <laughs> was we were doing underneath. So he was always a figure that I knew as I was growing up and he was, uh, he was familiar to me. So when I heard that it was his 500th birthday, I thought um, this is someone that should be celebrated or commemorated on their 500th anniversary. And I asked around to see if anybody was doing anything and it turned out that they weren't. There was nothing obvious that was happening. There was no films being made, there was no TV programs being produced that I could see. And so I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll do something then. Maybe I'll produce uh, a five minute video to go on YouTube, something like that. So I, I read the Wikipedia article on John Knox, which is always a good place to start. And um, <laughs> yep. I, uh, I realized as I was putting it together that this story was growing arms and legs. And it's a good story and deserves to be told. And so I realized that what I had was actually a feature film um, uh, and it turned out to be an hour and a quarter documentary about John Knox, which goes into his life, tells his story, and explains why he's important and why he's interesting. And that was the, flag the flagship production that Trinity Digital uh, was based around. So Trinity Digital, my company, the idea, is, the tagline for it is exploring Christianity through film. Because I think that there's uh, a lot of opportunity for Christianity and film to be in dialogue with each other and for Christianity to be explored in that cinematic medium. Mm -hmm. um, cinema is a, is a wonderful art form, and I really love cinema. And so it makes sense to, to see what cinema can say to Christianity and what Christianity can say back to, to cinema. I don't necessarily see it simply as a, what would I say, as an evangelistic tool or, or something like that. I do see it more as an art form, and therefore there's something about creating beauty in and of itself that is worthwhile, mm -hmm. even if nobody sees it, though of course I do prefer it if people see it, but uh, it's, uh, I think that's always been one of the things that motivates me, um, is, is the creation of beauty for beauty's sake. So how then would you distribute these films? I mean, you made more than that, of course. I can see you made uh, Seeing Grace and The Bishop and the Beggar as well.
It's very easy to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Life Stories at Lunch, to receive notifications of when we are live. Simply click the bell. I mean, you're looking great tonight. Uh, how are you feeling, your health wise? Feeling good, yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Feeling good. And Michael, um, any plans for the future of yourself? Um, my plans uh, is are to write more songs, release more songs, um, but also to share in terms of um, the worship leading perspective. Uh, I lead at, I participate in leading at church, trying to help other people on that journey to mm -hmm. worship leading and songwriting. So I've worked with um, there are two or three people in my local church who are actually in the process of releasing their own music. So wow. I've been involved with helping to kind of create curate one of the songs for one person and then three songs for another. So just trying to share and give back is my kind of main approach um, to this this stage of my life. I have noticed a lot a lot of the um, newer music is, is tending towards country music, actually, toward country mm -hmm. newer music. What would you say your style is then? My, my style is uh, grief. It, it, it's mm -hmm. definitely rooted in gospel music. That's what mm -hmm. I grew up on. Um, but I think I, because I've played with a variety of other people, there's, there are influences of folk and country in there sometimes. I love a good old country song, you can't beat that. Um, uh, popular music as well. I think there's bits of uh, soul music and bits, and bits of jazz. I love jazz as, a, as an art form, uh, as a phenomenal art form. So I think fusing them at the right time in the right space is kind of where I come from. So coming from the Pentecostal with you, jump around and bash the piano and... <laughs> <laughs> well, well, you're up on the piano and, you know. <laughs> my, my my thumbs decided that bashing the piano too long is not good for you. <laughs> you, you nails break very easily, so I, I try like and, and, uh, <laughs> can take myself as much as I can. <laughs> well, it's been fantastic speaking to both of you. And um, before you go, I have one question for each of you, and it's the same question basically, and we ask the same question to everybody on the show here. This, that is. Of all the decisions you have made in your life, what's the best decision you have ever made? Shell well, Marie. To follow Christ. That's the best decision. Best decision I ever made. I, I, I came into knowing who I really was and what I was here to do. That is the best thing because I have friends who still don't know what they're doing mm -hmm. and they need to know Christ. That would just open doors for them. That would give them peace that would give them just such a, oh, hmm. such a, a strength, just makes such a difference. And Michael? Yeah, absolutely. I think that decision to um, follow Jesus, be part of the kingdom of God and very much alert to the, the, just the vastness of his kingdom, his life purpose. Mm -hmm. um, there, is, there is no greater meaning to life until you we discover who Jesus is and what he means for our life and I know people think it's a bit uh, twee or easy just to fall back on a, a kind of religious um, concept mm -hmm. but he he Jesus is real he is the savior he is the son of God he is in heaven he does live inside of us and he has an intention for our lives and our lives only make sense when we allow him to be Lord of our lives. Well, thank you both so uh, very much for speaking to us here at Life Stories Worldwide, of course, and uh, uh, it will be broadcast again and again, and many people will see it worldwide, okay? Fabulous, thank you. So, thank you very much, and with that, I'll just hand back to Alan. Thank, thank you. you, George. Thank you so much, uh, Michael and Shal Marie, for sharing. It's been great having you with us, great hearing your stories, Great hearing how God's using you and blessing you. And pray you continue to do that in your various roles that you're doing. Please stay with us. Uh, before we finish, you're going to hear uh, one of Michael's songs. But I just want to remind you, there's several ways you can contact us. You can contact us on our phone line, plus four four seven nine four three five five zero two eight seven. You can also email us at uh, lifestoriesworldwide at gmail.com. You can visit our website, www.lifestoriesworldwide.com. And there you can find all sorts of information. You can watch other uh, stories that have been on other previous weeks. Many, many stories, all different types of stories. You can join there. We encourage you to subscribe to our Life Stories channel, which is um, 
you it is life stories at lunch our youtube channel life stories at lunch and youtube and click the subscription button and also don't forget to click the bell so we can notify you when we're going to be live you can also send messages on facebook at any time i want to invite you to join us next week again at um, eight o'clock uk time for another live story this time from scotland next week we have murdo mcleod murdo mcleod he was born in the isle of sky after um in his teens he, he, he graduated from a film studio he went to the uh, Film production at Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. And then he formed Trinity Digital after he graduated. And this company has a thematic slogan, exploring Christianity through film. And through this company, um, Murdo has directed and, and produced a number of films. He's also been involved in international TV and film uh, films. He'll show him a lot about that, I'm sure next week. So please tell your friends about next Monday to hear Murdo McLeod. So uh, you, you, you said you became a film director. Did that happen accidentally for you or is it something you planned or you moved into it, but you know, bit by bit? Um, I think it was something that I've been following this path since I was about maybe 22, 23, something like that. But uh, as I said before that, I wanted to be an actor. Um, and before that, I wanted to be a wizard. So, you know, it's not exactly the something I've been wanting to do all my life. In fact, when I was a very small child, I wanted to be a baker because then I'd have a, the opportunity to eat all the donuts afterwards. <laughs> now, as a film director and a Christian, of course, are there lines you won't cross or things you won't do? Or are I mean, you open to anything? I think everybody's got, uh, got lines that they won't cross. Uh, it's just a case of what these are. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, for myself, there would be things that I wouldn't want to have in my films. Um, mm -hmm. I certainly wouldn't want any actors or actresses to feel that they were being exploited in any of the mm -hmm. things that I was asking them to do. And I think that with the Me Too movement that's been coming out recently, there's a lot of new light has been shown on what actresses were expected to do to get their roles and to get their parts. And the way that um, when an actor or actress is in front of camera, they can sometimes be objectified by the people who are behind the camera and treated as though they're essentially just a, a, a organic prop. So I would always want to make sure that everybody was treated with absolute respect because I believe mm -hmm. in, um, that human beings are made in the image of God. And so it's very important to make sure that everyone retains their dignity throughout the, throughout the whole process. Um, Most of us know from reading and historically, of course, from Hollywood, that uh, the film industry in itself doesn't seem to have a very high moral standard. How, for you as a Christian, do you keep your moral standard in such an industry? I think the film industry is changing a lot. Um, for me, the biggest challenge has typically been working on Sundays, because as a Christian, I say, no, I'm not going to work on Sundays. I'm going to keep that day... Uh, for God, mm -hmm. which is a minority viewpoint, uh, I would say, even among Christians, and certainly amongst Christians who work in the film industry. So I, I fully respect other Christians that don't hold that viewpoint, but for me, that's just been part of my um, part of my belief structure all the way through, mm -hmm. is that I want to keep this day Sunday uh, special. As a result, it means that I sometimes miss out on work, perfectly understandably at times, because they might be requiring people who are available on Sundays, and that's, you know, what, when they're going to shoot. Um, other times, I would say it's it's less understandable. I had one time, uh, specifically one time, I remember I applied for a job and said in my covering letter, uh, I'm not going to be available on Sundays. I hope that's not an issue. And I got the, the email back saying, well, actually, we're not shooting on Sundays, but because you mentioned it and because you brought up that you're a Christian, I realize I don't want to work with you. So thank you and bye. Ooh. Uh, you know, the, that was quite early on in my uh, career. I think I'd have a different response now, but at the time I was just like, thank you very much, goodbye. But uh, now I think I'd be uh, more a case of, do you realize that this is religious discrimination? It's actually illegal what you're doing. Not so much for me, but so that he doesn't do it again to someone else or mm -hmm. you know, that I can change his mind about it a little bit. 
Um, I'm not sure whether he'd be so blatant about that now as he was back then, but uh, you do occasionally come across that sort of anti-Christian prejudice. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So when when it comes to filmmaking, I mean, you, you started. You said you started. Well, you started a company called Trinity, Trinity Digital. Is that correct? Yes. Tell us so, a little bit how that came about. So um, Trinity Digital was set up when I made my first documentary, which was called Knox. Uh, Knox is about John Knox, the uh, mm -hmm. reformer of Scotland. So in the same way that you've got Martin Luther and John Calvin as the sort of the big names in the continent, John Knox is the Scottish equivalent. And when I was growing up, we had a picture, a portrait of John Knox above our dining room table. He was always glowering down at us with his enormous great big eyebrows and his big beard as we were innocently trying to eat our toast or whatever it is <laughs> was we were doing underneath. So he was always a figure that I knew as I was growing up and he was, uh, he was familiar to me. So when I heard that it was his 500th birthday, I thought um, this is someone that should be celebrated or commemorated on their 500th anniversary. And I asked around to see if anybody was doing anything. And it turned out that they weren't. There was nothing obvious that was happening. There was no films being made. There was no TV programs being produced that I could see. And so I thought, oh, well, maybe I'll do something then. Maybe I'll produce uh, a five minute video to go on YouTube, something like that. So I, I read the Wikipedia article on John Knox, which is always a good place to start. And um, <laughs> yep. I, uh, I realized as I was putting it together that this story was growing arms and legs. And it's a good story and deserves to be told. And so I realized that what I had was actually a feature film. Um, uh, and it turned out to be an hour and a quarter documentary about John Knox, which goes into his life, tells his story, and explains why he's important and why he's interesting. And that was the, flag the flagship production that Trinity Digital uh, was based around. So Trinity Digital, my company, the idea is, the tagline for it is exploring Christianity through film. Because I think that there's uh, a lot of opportunity for Christianity and film to be in dialogue with each other and for Christianity to be explored in that cinematic medium. Mm -hmm. um, cinema is a, is a wonderful art form and I really love cinema. And so it makes sense to, to see what cinema can say to Christianity and what Christianity can say back to, to cinema. I don't necessarily see it simply as a, what would I say, as an evangelistic tool or, or something like that. I do see it more as an art form. And therefore, there's something about creating beauty in and of itself that is worthwhile, mm -hmm. even if nobody sees it. Though, of course, I do prefer it if people see it. But uh, it's... Uh, I think that's always been one of the things that motivates me um, is is the creation of beauty for beauty's sake. So how then would you distribute these films? I mean, you made more than that, of course. Uh, I can see you made uh, Seeing Grace and The Bishop and the Beggar as well. Life Stories. 